Dynamical Property to Fermi Upper Systems for the Fund Gas Microscope. Thank you, Andy, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the organizers for organizing this uh, workshop. So, uh, I would like to tell you about uh, the lights. Okay. Okay. It's okay? Okay. Okay. So uh, I would like to tell you about uh, experiments we're doing at Princeton, um, the Fermi Hubbard model with a quantum gas microscope. You'll be hearing several terms about similar systems, but uh, in this talk, I want to focus in particular on the dynamical properties of the, the Hubbard model. Um, so the, the system we're considering here is basically fermions in an optical lattice, two species of the fermions prepared in different hyperfine states. They uh, can tunnel around inside this lattice, between nearest neighbor sites, and uh, whenever two opposite spin fermions that have the same site, there's a strong impact, uh, repulsive interaction. So uh, there's a lot of reasons to study this model. On a most sort of fundamental level, it's a paradigm for studying strong coupling uh, in a lattice. Uh, it's been studied for a very long time, uh, in particular because of a uh, suggestion by Phil Anderson that this model uh, could uh, capture the physics of the high temperature coupe rates. Uh, in particular, maybe their uh, high temperature, high temperature superconductivity, and uh, we uh, we can realize this exactly with uh, cold atoms and optical lattices with fully tunable parameters. So we can tune things like tunneling using the lattice step, the interactions with flashback resonances. We can uh, tune the doping of the system. We can tune the temperature. So in this way, we can sort of do a quantum simulation of this. Uh, this model. So. Um, the, the phase diagram of uh, the Hubbard model, uh, something that we don't quite know at low temperatures, but uh, we can look for inspiration at the phase diagram of the coupe rates, which I showed here. And um, the, in the coupe rates, this is a temperature doping phase diagram. In the coupe rates, we uh, see that at uh, temperatures below the interaction energy, uh, when the system is undoped, the parent compound is a molten solator where density fluctuations are suppressed. So we have uh, one electron per site. And then as you lower the temperature, you get into an intermagnetic phase where the spin order is below the super exchange uh, temperature. Once you start to dope this, so, so this part of the phase diagram we, we know pretty well from uh, simulations of the Hubbard model. Uh, we, do, we, we do see that it reduces these features of the coupe rates. But where things sort of get hairy with the simulations because of the sign problem that uh, Richard talked about, um, is once you start to dope the system, okay? So once you start to dope, in the coupe rates we see a lot of uh, very interesting phases. Um, there's of course the new wave superconductor, uh, but even in the normal state we have uh, interesting uh, phases like this uh, pseudo gap regime where there's a suppression of the spectral weight close to the Fermi surface. There's a strange metal where there's anomalous transport properties, and there's many phases that are not even in this phase diagram like you know, stripes and commensurate intermagnets, etc. So, uh, so this is really the, re the regime where it would be very interesting to start doing these quantum simulations. So, uh, with this goal in mind, the Colab community, of course, has been working on uh, doing quantum simulations uh, with the Hubbard uh, systems for with cold atoms and optical lattice for quite a while, starting with uh, pioneering experiments in the group of uh, Tillman and Manuel. More recently, there has been a strong uh, push. Uh, in this field coming with the production of fermionic quantum gas microscope, uh, microscopes realized by these groups. So now we can really go into these systems and probe them at the level of uh, single sites. We can measure things like <coughs> spin correlations, density correlations, and really diagnose the phases that we have, like the mot insulators and anti So uh, in my group, we have a, a fermion microscope for lithium-6. Uh, lithium-6, uh, from an experimental point of view, is a wonderful atom to work with. Uh, it's light, so the tunneling in the lattice is, is quite fast, so we can um, prepare states adiabatically uh, over pretty quickly. And uh, it has wide flashback resonances, which make for easy tuning of interactions. Uh, so here's a picture we take with this quantum gas microscope. Each one of these dots is a single atom. Uh, here you can see the atoms thermally hopping during the imaging. Uh, so this here, during the imaging, we're applying Raman siphon cooling on the atoms to keep them at a reasonably low temperature. Uh, so here, we've deliberately sort of let them get a bit hot so they can, you can see this hopping in this movie just for fun. But uh, but usually, we just sort of have uh, <coughs> I think we distracted Sarah with 
it. Are there particles appearing out of nowhere in that movie? It looks like <laughs> so like on the bottom right of uh, your movie, it's kind of popped yeah. out of nowhere. I don't know which particle you're referring to, but I mean sometimes there's like these jumps that are we see the pictures of atoms not just hopping one side but hopping many sites. That there might be stuff coming from a different layer. Um, I mean, we, we hope it's uh, there's like really no atoms in the other layer, but sometimes so that comes in. Okay. So um, okay. So let me show you some of the sort of canonical phases of the undoed system first. So here's a picture of a system where you can see a Mott insulator. Um, these microscopes often the point spread function is very comparable to that of spacing, so it's, it's hard to see the individual uh, the individual atoms in this Mott insulator, but you can see sort of whenever you have a missing atom, you see a little pole. Uh, so this could be because of some sort of thermal excitation or because of the imaging fidelity not being quite perfect. So in this cloud, the, the chemical potential uh, is such that in the center of the trap, we have uh, an undoed system of Mott insulator, and then as you go towards the edge of the trap, you get into a metallic phase. Um, now, if we increase the chemical potential even further, we get pictures like this. So here, the chemical potential is in the band gap, and uh, so you have two atoms per site on each site, and um, and now light-assisted collisions in these microscope. Uh, eject uh, the atoms from the lattice, and so where we used to have a band insulator before the imaging stage, we get uh, this hole, and so, so here there used to be a band insulator, and now that's surrounded by a moth insulating shell around that. Okay. So that's uh, one of the things you expect in the undoed system. If you go to lower temperatures, then another thing you expect also in the Hubbard model is the anti magnet, which has also been observed uh, in these uh, multiple groups here. Um, so, it, uh, and what we're doing here is we are, in this picture is we uh, blow away one of the spin states and look at the remaining spins, and we can see these sort of checkerboard structures in part of the cloud. You don't ex so, so that's evidence for this antiferromagnet. We don't expect to see it everywhere because the system is in a harmonic trap, so only sort of in the half-filled region you expect to see the antiferromagnet. Uh, furthermore, the system is at finite temperature, there's a lot of quantum fluctuations, so we only expect these sort of antiferromagnet patches to sort of bubble up here and there. Um, and uh, if we want to sort of do a more quantitative job, we can look at the equal time spin correlations in the system. And uh, we can see that in the undoped region, we can get um, uh, so the status like from a few years ago, correlation lengths of a few sites. Now we can uh, use these uh, correlations as a, these spin correlations as a thermometer by comparing to quantum Monte Carlo calculations. And uh, now the most recent temperatures we can get in the lab is about 30% of, uh, of the time. Okay, so uh, you'll be hearing a lot about now uh, looking at these equal time spin correlations, also looking at them in the sort of in the doped regime. So, for example, Marcus's group has studied sort of how these spin correlations vanishes as you start to dope the system, the antiferromagnet sort of disappears. You can also see evidence, for example, from now from MBQ with uh, uh, the appearance of incommensurate antiferromagnets. But what I want to focus on uh, in my talk is um, sort of um, these phases that I have in this phase diagram for the doped system, in particular the strange metal and the pseudo gap, and those are related to unequal time correlations. So, um, in particular, for example, the strange metal, there are anomalous properties of uh, the resistivity. Uh, it behaves, uh, it scales linearly with the temperature as opposed to the quadratic behavior you might expect in a Fermi liquid. So, from the Kubo relationship, we know that this. Uh, conductivity is related to unequal time current correlations. Okay, and uh, if we want to look at the pseudo gap phase, so there one has to look for a suppression of spectral weight near the Fermi surface. So you have to kind of measure the spectral function, which is again related to some another unequal time correlator. So clearly, that's not the kind of stuff we get out of the microscope directly. So what we have to do is go and measure these uh, response functions. And I'm going to show you the techniques we've developed to probe. Um, so the conductivity uh, in, this, uh, in this regime here. And since our temperatures are still not yet at temperatures low enough to probe the pseudo gap in the repulsive model, I want to show you how we've started looking at spectral functions in the attractive Hubbard model. OK, so, uh, so let, let me tell you first about the strange metal, or sometimes known as a bad metal. 
but uh, I want to contrast it with what a grid metal is. So uh, in a grid metal, you have, uh, we're imagining system with weak interactions. So you have a Fermi liquid picture system where you have quasi-particles which can transport the various quantities like charge, spin, energy, etc. These uh, quasi-particles move around and collide with each other um, every mean three path or so. And um, that gives rise to resistivity in the system. So in our systems, um, we don't have any phonons because the lattice is rigid. We don't have disorder. So really, the resistivity arises just purely from the interparticle interactions. <coughs> um, and we can relate this mean free path to sort of a momentum relaxation rate, which through a Buda formula now is linked to its resistivity. So the mean free path uh, is bounded, of course, in any systems. So uh, in particular, in a quasi-particle system, it doesn't make sense to talk about the mean free path that's smaller than interparticle spacing. Or maybe in a lattice system, you would say it can't be smaller than the lattice spacing. So these sort of bounds go by the name of Motiafi regular limits, uh, sort of sets a, a minimum for the mean free path in a quasi-particle system. So as you increase the temperature of uh, the system, its mean free path goes down, but it can't go below this uh, value. And uh, so, so what that means for the resistivity is that you find that the resistivity in a quasi-particle system should saturate at, this mod, at the bound given by the Motiafi regular limit. And another sort of uh, characteristic of, we, of this weak interacting regime that we get from the Boltzmann transport equation combined with the Fermi liquid theory is that the resistivity due to interparticle scattering scales like the square of the temperature. Okay? So it starts at scale like the square of the temperature and eventually saturates at high temperatures. Now, in the strongly interacting regime, uh, we no longer have quasi-particles. So this, these bounds are no longer relevant. And experimentally, we find that uh, there's a wide variety of materials, uh, like the cuprates, nickel, etc., that exhibit uh, what, what's called a bad or strange metallic behavior. They violate this MIR limit. And uh, very commonly, one sees a resistivity that is scaling linearly in temperature, even well below the divide temperature. Okay, so this is not coming from phonons, uh, as far as we can tell. It's, it's a poorly understood regime, basically because we don't have big tools to understand the system. We don't have the Boltzmann transport equation. OK, so uh, you've already heard uh, this morning about this um, beautiful work of measuring transport uh, in Tillman's group. Uh, there's uh, also uh, been recent work measuring uh, optical conductivity in lattice systems from Tillman's group, uh, from, uh, uh, from Joseph Pybusson's group. And also, you'll hear later uh, about uh, work probing the same sort of regime I'm going to be talking about from uh, Brian and Marcus. OK, so the, the challenge here is how to measure the resistivity. And uh, the, the approach my group took is we want to measure bulk resistivity. But what we want to do, uh, since that's been kind of challenging the cold atom system, the approach we're taking is to link this to a microscopic quantity, which is the diffusion constant. And then there's <coughs> a, this uh, famous relationship in condensed matter that links the conductivity, or one over the resistivity, to this diffusion constant through the compressibility. So this is known as the Nernst-Einstein relationship. So essentially what we'll do is we'll measure the diffusion constant and then measure the compressibility, and from that extract the resistivity. Um, OK, so how do we do that? Well, we wanted to do a pretty clean measurement of the system, so we didn't want to be worried about sort of this inhomogeneous uh, density profile. So for this particular experiment, we flattened uh, the, the lattice. So the, we have a uniform density in the system. Uh, that we're using light projected through a spatial light modulator. And uh, now we start with a uniform density in the dope regime, about sort of 20% doping. Um, and in a strongly interacting system, U over T roughly about 8. And what we do now is we use a spatial light modulator to project a light pattern onto the atoms that has a long wavelength modulation. We can control the wavelength anywhere from, say, a couple of sites all the way up to the full system size. So that's a one-dimensional density modulation that we can produce. You can see it here in this picture, these stripes. So basically, we load the system adiabatically into this modulated density. Okay, so, so that's the starting point. And now to measure diffusion, what we do is we suddenly snap off this long wavelength potential and let the fermions diffuse in the lattice. Okay? and track what happens, and from the dynamics, we extract a diffusion constant. So, uh, so here's a 
sort of the, what we see, uh, this is the initial state at t equals just zero minus, just below switching off. We see a sort of sinusoidal pattern that we put in, uh, in one of the spin states. And now, within sort of, very quickly, within a few hundred microseconds, this pattern disappears completely. So we, we basically fit the amplitude of the sinusoid versus time, and we get a picture like this. Okay? So uh, you can see there's a bit of an underdamp oscillation. This data here was taken for a modulation wavelength of about five sites. Um, and now we can change the wavelength. Let's go from five sites to 10 sites. You can see it becomes more damped. And then to 15 sites, even more damped. To 20 sites, completely damped. Okay. okay, so now we want a simple model to fit this data. And the model we've come up with is the following. It's a hydrodynamic model, basically. Um, so, so the first equation is something, of course, we expect to hold true, charge conservation. And then the second equation is um, more of a phenomenological equation. Okay? So your first attempt at modeling this transport might be to say, well, you know, in the, at, at long wavelengths, you just sort of see something like an exponential decay, sort of the typical behavior you see in diffusion. So that you can get from fixed low. So you see that the current is proportional to the gradient of the density with this d the diffusion constant is the proportionality constant. Now, there's a problem with this. Is, you know, that reduces the exponential part at long wavelengths, but it doesn't give you these oscillations, right? And the problem is that the, basically what fixed law says is that as soon as you impose a density gradient, you get a current. But uh, in order to get sort of this oscillation, we need uh, some sort of inertial effect. So what we're saying now is that this current cannot change instantaneously it has to kind of decay to the value given by fixed low. And it decays to this value with some rate gamma, which we'll call the current relaxation rate. So basically what we've done is we've uh, combined these two equations. It gives us a second order differential equation, a damped harmonic oscillator, with a damping gamma and a frequency squared, which is related to gamma d, and k squared, which is k is the wave, length, uh, the wave vector of the modulation. So you can see that now, as you tune k, you tune this omega, so you can sort of cross over between sort of an underdamped regime and an overdamped uh, regime. Okay. So basically, we fit all the data for all the different k's we take with a single gamma and a single d. So that proves that the hydrodynamic model works. And uh, we, we extract them. And now we've looked at them versus temperature. Okay. So that's the, maybe the interesting thing to do here, since we want to study this uh, strain of metal physics. So, um, so you can see now the diffusion constant as you lower the temperature goes up. With yes. the solid lines the fits on the previous Yes, this is the fits to this model. Single gamma and single. Okay. So, so now the diffusion constant goes up as you lower the temperature. Expected, as you lower the temperature, you, the polybuck imposes scattering channels, so this has to go up, and the gamma goes down. Uh, so, um, so, so now, uh, one interesting thing to look at is the limit that this D approaches at high temperatures. And we can get a bond on that from the Montiaffi regular limit, if, assuming we have quasi-particles. So basically, the mean free path uh, uh, we have a bond on, which is the lattice constant. And uh, then uh, we can relate that through the sort of a Fermi velocity to, to a diffusion constant. And this is this dashed line here. Okay. So, uh, I want you to take this with a grain of salt because there are many different definitions for for the Montiaffi regular limit of the constants, but we do see see some sort of saturation here. Okay. Now, the the other ingredient we need to the story to get at the resistivity is uh, the compressibility, right? And that we have known in the cold atom community how to measure for a long time. So if you just put the atoms in a harmonic trap. Uh, the local chemical potential is scanned by the trap. So if you look at the density variation due to this varying chemical potential, you get the compressibility. And uh, so these are this experimental data here of the compressibility versus temperature. This is now an equal time uh, correlation. So it's pretty easy to calculate with Monte Carlo. So the equal time density correlations give you the compressibility. And uh, that's these green, not green points here. And they agree pretty well with the data. But the reason I'm showing this graph is mostly to show you one interesting thing here, that we can also compute what the high temperature limit of the compressibility is expected to be. It goes like 
uh, 1 over the temperature. Okay? So that's this line plotted here. And the key thing to emphasize here is that we are not in the high temperature limit. We're kind of deviating from the high temperature limit. The reason I bring this up is that there is an easy way that was put forth a long time ago by David Hughes and others to get uh, a linear resistivity in the high temperature regime. So at very high temperatures, if your compressibility goes as 1 over T, you, and you also expect the diffusion constant to saturate, then the conductivity goes as 1 over T, and the resistivity is proportional to T. Okay, but the key thing is we're not in this high temperature limit. We're sort of in an intermediate temperature. This holds true when you're much higher than the bandwidth, basically, than 8T. Okay, but we're exploring sort of a temperature regime between 0.3T up to 8T. Okay, so now here comes the magical part. We, we combine this compressibility with a diffusion constant, which both have non-trivial temperature dependences. And we find experimentally that this resistivity is linear in the temperature. Okay? We can characterize how linear it is, but it's a very good line. Um, and furthermore, it does violate the Motiapi regular limit on the resistivity, which is this dashed the gray line that you see here. Uh, that part is not unexpected. As I said, the compressibility at high temperatures has to go as 1 over T, so eventually it has to kind of exceed this multi limit, even from the statics. Uh, but, but this resistivity is something that uh, we find very interesting. And uh, we can compare that to various numerics. So we've uh, done a finite temperature Lanchos uh, calculation down to temperatures of about 1. That's when the finite size effects kind of kick in. So this is on a 4 by 4 lattice. The calculation takes about a 1. And you can see this, there's no free parameters at all. It fits very well to the data. We've also done comparisons to dynamical mean field theory, which is an approximate theory only expected to kind of work in the infinite dimensions. It does deviate from the data. It has additional features. So it has a straight line behavior here, and it has a kink. This is kind of reproducing what has been seen in many previous works from Cotelier, uh, Juan George, and others. Okay, so uh, okay, so that was the sort of the strange metal part of the square. Can uh, quick one? Yeah. You have a lot of data points. Could you tell the difference between T and T log T? The point point is that in the old days, right, in high diseases, and there was this issue of if we can get there's almost no difference between the two. You have a fairly good system. Well, I mean. For, now to, to kind of take it away from, to, from so, okay, so first, I mean, okay, so if you want to Fermi liquid, you can try to do it by like going to weak interactions and, or doping the system. That's something we haven't done yet, but that would be indeed in very interesting to explore. There you would expect to eventually recover the quadratic behavior. So that's some more work for us to do. Uh, do you love T? I don't think I can, <laughs> I can tell you that. What, what doping was this? This is 17% uh, plus minus a few percent. Yeah, we can. This yeah, data that we already so have a year to do, but uh, hmm? it's only in a year seventeen percent. We we haven't tested. This is this was mostly scanning the temperature. It's a big phase diagram. We can scan interactions, the doping. Here we've worked at U over T seven point five and point eighty three, so seventeen percent doping, and we scan the temperature. But the next thing is to go and scan the the doping. Yeah, there are some definite predictions for the change of that slope, so it would be really Yeah, I agree. It's, it's very interesting. Too. Asking my graduates to get on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. Actually, one more question. What is the, the, the significance of the offset? Uh, Experimentally, uh, we see an offset. Uh, the the FTL does see an offset too yeah. if you extrapolate to zero. I don't think we expect to see an offset if you were actually at t equal to zero, right? Uh, I mean, the DMFT predicts it seems like it goes down. Uh, I mean, like, system is supposed to go superconducting at some point. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I mean, it's just the extrapolation of I don't know what the significance is. The experimental error about it here is very small down there, so it seems to be significant. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can see the DMFT kind of gets a sharp slope here then. Uh, yeah. OK, so, so how much time do I have? Yeah, uh, five minutes and those questions. OK, let's see if I can. Tell you a little bit about uh, spectral functions. Um, okay, so so the other part of the phase diagram, that of course, interesting to explore eventually, is this uh, is the pseudo gap part. Um, 
been looking at various papers predicting where the pseudo gap should happen. And the Hubbard model, they seem to be kind of a factor of two or three lower temperatures we, we can reach right now. So, uh, but it might still be, you know, if we, this workshop comes up with ideas to cool down even further, it might be good to be ready with the tools uh, to start probing this physics. So the, the tool uh, is this um, photo emission spectroscopy, which is a pretty standard tool in condensed matter. You, you send in a photon uh, in just a photoelectric effect. You inject uh, electrons from this interacting system. You measure their energy and momentum distribution. And that contains information about the single particle excitation spectrum of the main body system. And, uh, that has been done in um, this was a technique that was introduced to the cold energy community in the group of uh, the late Debbie Jin. Um, and she used it to study uh, 3D unitary Fermi gases. It was also applied to 2D uh, Fermi gases in the cold group. And now what we're trying to do here is to kind of extend this technique to Hubbard systems. So the, the, the key sort of maybe interesting thing to look for is these pseudo gaps, which are basically a depression in the spectral function of the Fermi energy. And uh, they're kind of hard, to, so they've been observed, of course, in a wide variety of materials, like the cuprates. Uh, uh, so basically, you're seeing this depression even before the system goes superconducting. Um, and um, it's been observed in these uh, cold atom experiments, too. But in the cold atom experiments, it's kind of the evidence is rather indirect. So what they usually look for is not so much the, the suppression of spectral weight, but more they just look for this backbending feature in the dispersion, which is sort of indicative of uh, BCS dispersion. Um, so one system which we do know that has uh, that has an, a pseudo gap is the attractive Hubbard model. So um, it, as you already heard from the previous talk, the there is no sign problem for the attractive Hubbard model. So we can do we can see perfectly there. Um, and uh, it does predict something like this as a function of sort of the interaction. There is a BEC BCS crossover. And uh, in the BCS limit, there is no pseudo gap. As you sort of approach the inter regime, you start to have a separation between sort of T star and TC. Uh, so this is evidence for, this, uh, for the pseudo gap. And uh, so we thought that would be a good place to start sort of testing this technique um, in, our, in our system. So, what we would love to do eventually is sort of do a, and what we're actually doing now is a comparison with quantum uh, Monte Carlo group from Tom DeGroy's group with um, with the experimental data. Okay, so let me. There's, there's been several technical challenges why this hasn't been done in lattice systems. So uh, I, I feel like microscopes are a good place to to, to do this. So so what what we the first challenge is that. Um, you, we need to transfer atoms. So, so the way it works is you send in an RF photon uh, and you flip a spin. Let's say we start with a mixture of the first and third lowest hyperfine state of lithium. Uh, they are strongly interacting and we're working at a very low field. So typically about 5 Gauss. Okay? So there the 1-3 interaction is strong, about 450 Bohr ADI. The 1-2 interaction is almost vanishing. And the 2-3 interaction is only 20 Bohr ADI. Okay, so this is now, uh, this helps a lot with eliminating final state interactions. So what we do is we use an RF photon to flip from 1 to 2, but this final state, the 2 state, is not interacting with the, with the rest of the spin states. Okay, so in particular, one can look at the final state mean free path. In previous work with potassium there, the mean free path was about 6 times the cloud size. Here we have about 100 times the cloud size. So it's really a non-interacting system, uh, what with the, those final octopole atoms. The second challenge is now we're typically transferring, you know, something on the order of 10, 15 percent of the atoms. Uh, so this would be like in the <coughs> clouds about just a few ten atoms. Okay, so very small signal. And now uh, to, to kind of measure the momentum, what we do is a band mapping to convert the quasi momentum to real momentum. But then uh, you need to do to measure the momentum using a time of flight technique. And so the density will drop ridiculously. So what we, what we do is we, we, we'll just get out of the field of your microscope. So to get into momentum space quickly, we use the same techniques that Stelm uses uh, um, in his experiments. We use this um, uh, the, an expansion in the presence of a harmonic trap. So basically, after a quarter period, we convert momentum to position. 
Okay, so that gives us now the momentum of the odd coupled atoms. So we can now use sort of momentum energy, the interacting and the non-interacting band structure. Okay. So, so what we need to do at the end is to add back the, the non-interacting dispersion. And uh, you know, in a in a the experiments that were done in the continuum, this is a simple t squared over two m. In this lattice system, it's, a, it's, the, it's the lattice dispersion. So we've we've come up with a <coughs> nice graph spectroscopy technique to calibrate the non-interacting band structure so that we can add this uh, based on experimental data. So just to get kind of set you up for seeing the the data, let me just discuss maybe the VCS limit. So here's the dispersion of the quasi particles in the lattice for non-interacting gas. Okay, so this is going along the contour from gamma to x to m and back in the Bruin zone. And now if you introduce a weak interaction, the VCS limit, you open it up a gap at the Fermi surface. And so this is sort of the emission part of the spectral function, and this is the uh, injection part. So what you see is this stuff here, basically. And the key thing is to see this back bending here, which is indicative of the VCS dispersion. So the pictures are very pretty. So uh, it's now actually angle result, unlike the previous experiments, it's angle result on energy spectroscopy because of the presence of the lattice, there's an actual interesting angular dependence. So here I'm showing you just like, as we scan the frequency, the momentum of the odd coupled atoms at every uh, frequency. Uh, but the key thing I want to show you is just now we can use this data to extract the, the spectral functions. So in the non-interacting system, the width would be limited by Fourier broadening, or sort of in the energy direction. But the width that you're seeing in these spectral functions is actually much larger than that. So this is a really intrinsic width. And uh, in, in solar <coughs> model, you see the non-interacting uh, non uh, dispersion. And these dash, so these crosses here are now what we, the deviation because of the interactions. Okay? So basically, what we're seeing here is we increase the temperature from 0.3 to 1.2 to 2. We approach the non-interacting dispersion. So that these, okay. So, so now the, the most interesting thing I want to focus on in the last minute here is just uh, that if we focus, if we look at the Fermi momentum, which in our system is about here, you can see that there is a back bending of the dispersion, which is indicative of this uh, ECS. Okay. Okay, so uh, with that, I'd like to conclude. So we've observed this linear and t-scaling of the resistivity of the particular interaction and density. As we've already said, it would be very interesting to look at other interactions and dopings. Do we recover the t-squared dependence? How special is the doping we work at? I have to point out here that there's also recent work from Tom de Rose group, which goes even lower than our experiment now in temperature. It goes up to 0.2t, and they're seeing a perfect line at u over t6. Um, okay, and then, of course, the big question here is there, in sort of an analytic way, we can understand this linear tier resistivity, not just from the numerics. And we're currently testing this ARPIS on an attractive Hubbard model. Uh, we're in the process of doing quantitative comparisons with DQMC, which are a bit complicated because for this experiment, we haven't flattened the trap, so we have to average over a lot of densities. Uh, of course, the big question is, can we get cold enough to start seeing pseudo gaps in the repulsive power system? So with that, I'd like to thank uh, the people who have done this work. Uh, so Devon, and I'll just move to the CUA, uh, working with John Doyle. Uh, Peter and Elmer are the other two graduate students working on the Hubbard experiments, together with uh, Dr. Peter Schaus, who's now at the University of uh, Virginia. And uh, we've had a lot of theory support, in particular from David Hughes, on analyzing uh, the data and coming up with a hydrodynamic model and uh, the numerical proofs uh, listed here, including this one. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, we have time for questions. Yeah. Uh, did you establish the temperature through the spin correlations? Uh, so, which, so, which experiment? So, for the attractive Hubbard, we don't have the spin correlations. We have the, right. the charge density wave correlations, which you mentioned. Uh, so close to half the length, we, we have those, and we can compare those to Monte Carlo, and that's how we're, how these like temperatures that are listed here, that's how we get those. Uh, even up to T over T of 8? Uh, I mean, at very high temperatures, we can eventually switch uh, to density correlations. That's what we did in, in the 
uh, in the <coughs> supercooled system, but here for this experiment, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, we can use it either. We actually fit everything. We fit both charge density wave correlations and density correlations and just extract the temperature. Mm -hmm. Yes, right here. Okay. Um, the photo in which we spectroscopy is very nice. I was wondering, have you applied the same technique for the attractive carbon model? Because people believe, like, well, this, is, this is more attractive. Oh, sorry, we have, we have it. Seems like near the Fermi surface, 
we want to be looking at the diagonal near the Fermi surface, but then in Debbie's paper, she was saying, like, if you go to 1.5 kf, there's the expected behavior just from the short range character of mm -hmm. the interactions. But I, I don't know. Okay, let's thank all of you.